Hi guys, uh, welcome to part two of this discussion. Uh, we'll be conducting a champions exam that will be between the 17th and uh, 21st of April. So that would help you uh, refine your reflexes and re practice your skill set as well. So I would suggest you to join and apply for this mock test. And uh, you can register at any point of time. It's absolutely free. And uh, now we're going to start with LRR. Uh, that's the last resort revision. Uh, this would give you that extra edge that is required for uh, getting to that coveted rank. So uh, let's uh, go ahead and start discussing the first question for today. And I just want a quick uh, uh, confirmation from your side with respect to the audiovisual part. And then we are good to go for today. And this question is uh, from cardiovascular system as was requested. So we are going to do a couple of ECGs today, which will uh, let us know how well are will be sorted as far as these ECGs and interpretations of the same are concerned. And then I've also included a couple of, you know, uh, scenarios which uh, would let you know, I mean, whether you have read about them properly or not. So we are having this patient who's having breathing difficulty on lying supine and uh, then you the he's uh, describing the elevated jvp he's showing the ecg which is very characteristic and he's saying which of the following drugs would be best suited for uh, the management of this patient so yes guys uh, i can have a quick uh, input from you side you side you guys uh, with respect to this question Because what you can pick up in this question is that very characteristic. Uh, in fact, I'll zoom into the ECG so that it becomes relatively much more easier for you to comprehend because I always advise you to look at lead number two. And uh, then in lead number two, you can pick up uh, specifically at this point of time, the variation. If I say anything more, actually, uh, it's it's going to become uh, very, very, you know, uh, in your face and very, very characteristic. So yes, guys, uh, we are talking about absence of P wave. We are seeing a variable RR interval. So I'm waiting for answer in this one. No, doctor, this is not electrical alternance. Uh, this would be a variation in uh, the RR interval. I mean, a huge, huge variation in the RR interval that you can see in this case with absence of P wave. So this is going to be atrial fibrillation. And then he's going to ask us regarding what drug would be used. So. Uh, Yes, guys, uh, let's uh, wait for a couple of answers. I mean, I'm getting various uh, kind of feeds here already. Uh, I'm getting C, Virapamil, as an answer to this question. So normally we use, uh, if I say anything more, the answer will become obvious. So, uh, okay, B, C, D are used for rate control and all of them are given. So there must be some trick in the question because uh, traditionally for management of rate control in atrial fibrillation, we would be having uh, beta blockers being used. Uh, but this patient, you can notice he is having features of heart failure. I mean, there is a breathing difficulty that is on lying supine, JVP is elevated. So uh, because the patient is having a concomitant heart failure and is having a pulmonary edema, we need to be very, very suited or very, very sorted with respect to that. Should we be giving beta blocker to somebody with a pulmonary edema? You very well know that if you will give beta blocker, you are going to put on brakes in a chap with the uh, pulmonary edema and that will worsen that case i mean beta blockers we are always going to use but then at the same time if you are going to give beta blocker to somebody with pulmonary edema you will control atrial fibrillation no doubt about it but you are going to cause deterioration of the heart failure of this space so uh, i'm still getting c as a feed would you be giving uh, uh, metoprolol in heart failure no would you be giving uh, virapamil or diltiazem because they'll act on the av node again and they'll again control the heart rate and they'll again cause deterioration of this patient so we cannot use a beta blocker we cannot use virapamil and diltiazem guys pulmonary edema agar present hai to pulmonary edema wale patient mein to hum beta blocker aur calcium channel blocker dono hi use nahi karte hain the answer for this question is option number a that is digoxin I've explained this also that atrial fibrillation ke rate control ke liye small all hai, but you must always be very very careful about that is there any pulmonary edema present in the patient. We either can use a B or we can be using a C that is Virapamil or Diltiazem in the case. But considering that it is atrial fibrillation with heart failure findings and there is a documented pulmonary edema in a sense that breathlessness is uh, increasing on supine position. So because he's, he is giving me that characteristic orthopnea, which is a feature of heart failure, the correct answer for this would be that I can use digoxin in this patient. The advantage of digoxin would be that uh, 
it's gonna utilize vegas and it will help in management of both the things it will help in heart failure also and it will help in management of atrial fibrillation also so the correct answer for this question is option number a the main concept is that whenever you are answering rate control in any question of uh, atrial fibrillation uh, you must take into consideration two aspects one is he might play the trick like he did in neat pg and he put up an atrial fibrillation patient and he said that he is a poorly controlled asthma so obviously we will not use beta blocker in poorly controlled asthma and it would then be calcium channel blocker but in this mcq you know that's the second version of the mcq what i did was or what the what is the common scenario is that he'll put in a heart failure scenario and then you will be saying that okay i'm not gonna use uh, even calcium channel blockers in this patient i'll just repeat the core features once again before i just move on to my subsequent slide in a question of atrial fibrillation uh, there are three permutation combinations first we'll just talk about how would you go ahead with rate control so your answer is obviously short acting beta blocker because bp is low so that is why a short acting beta blocker but if, if he adds the word asthma in the question and he talks about rate control then we will change our answer to verapamil or deltiazem whichever is available in the question but if he adds pulmonary edema in the question and he says that what approach would you like to use for rate control in this patient then the answer would be given as digoxin uh, we also do not give uh, verapamil or digoxin in heart failure because if you are going to use verapamil or digoxin they'll also slow down the heart see tachycardia is what keeps the patient alive you see cardiac output ka formula kya hota hai heart rate multiplied by stroke volume stroke volume is less so there is a compensatory tachycardia the tachycardia is the one that is keeping the patient alive if you are gonna slow the heart virapamil slows the heart now by acting on the av node deltiazem slows the heart by acting on the av node and esmolol anyway slows the heart so the point is uh, i think uh, uh, pcm now it's very very clear uh, that uh, why i'm i don't want to apply brakes because fast beating heart will help in clearing of pulmonary edema अगर आप उस पर ब्रेक्स लगा दोगे यू प्रेस ऑन द ब्रेक्स यू आर डीसल रेटिंग द हार्ट यू आर बेसिकली कटिंग ऑफ समथिंग दैट विल कीप द पेशेंट अलाइव एंड दैट इज द बेसिक थिंग टू रिमेंबर ओके सोमिया से इज लुक्स लाइक अ पी एस वी टी डी नंबर वी टू या डॉक्टर बट देन यू नीड टू लुक एट लीड नंबर टू नो दैट इज द बेस्ट वे दैट इज वे दिस इन नो द लीड नंबर टू लीड नंबर वी टू इज द बेस्ट वन दैट इज गोना बी यूजफुल टू आइडेंटिफाई वट A rhythm disorder is present because in the remaining leads the number of complexes will be relatively lesser so uh, i think uh, yeah, it's it's uh, gonna be uh, lead number 2 which is also referred to as uh, uh, the rhythm strip the highlight of this ecg is that absent p wave and then you can notice the variable rr interval so everybody did a great job in picking up uh, uh everybody did a very great job in picking up atrial fibrillation but then you had to pick up these permutation combinations which uh, i have currently Uh, uh evaluated before you and as far as uh, the contraindications of standard drugs are concerned they always love to ask it no the, the they'll always ask you contraindication to uh, nitrates so one of the biggest contraindication to nitrates is anyway hypotension i mean if the bp of the patient is uh, less than 80 mm of mercury you should not be using nitrates uh, you should not be using nitrates in inferior wall myocardial infarction you would not use them if somebody is already using sildenafil uh or uh, tadala feel that's understandable i mean a guy who's uh, who's given nitrates also and is uh, you know also taking sildenafil then the vasodilatory action of the two will add up and that will cause deterioration and we do not give nitrates in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy because that's the only scenario where chest pain worsens with um, uh, uh, chest pain worsens with the uh, administration nitrates i'll just uh, mention this uh, once again uh, in this slide only the only scenario where you will get chest pain and uh, this chest pain is present at rest but it is in a young guy 20 25 years of age and you get nitrates and it increases in intensity on nitrates then uh, the first differential that you need to consider is always hypertrophic cardiomyopathy the reason for this is understandable nitrates are veno directors predominantly so they will decrease the blood supply coming to the right side of the heart if you decrease the blood supply to the right side of the heart the blood coming to left side of the heart will also decrease and the problem is the blood supply uh, the left ventricle of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is already small why this chap of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy already is having less left ventricular endostolic volume if i will give nitrates it will cause worsening of the filling of the left ventricle because it will it will act like a veno dilator so less blood will come to right less will go into left and left is already having less blood if lv edv will decrease the blood pressure of this patient will begin to fall 
and the decrease in the blood pressure of this patient will mean that there would be reduction in the coronary blood flow and uh, if you reduce the coronary blood flow then the chest pain will worsen in this chap so i mean this is the only scenario where chest pain tends to worsen with the uh, administration of a drug that is nitrates that is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy uh doctor it will act both no it will act on both veins as well as arteries but is predominantly a venodilator it reduces the uh, preload of the heart but at the same time will dilate the coronary arteries also yes and yeah all standard drugs jaya you perfectly right all standard drugs will uh, not be giving so that would be contraindications to nitrate then beta blocker contraindications are you know very standard ones i mean we would not like to give it in anybody with a high grade uh, uh, high grade uh, av blocker high grade uh, heart block present because if heart rate is less than 60 uh, giving a beta blocker would be a disaster similarly decompensated heart failure as was the situation in this case because there was a pulmonary edema so i'm saying decompensated heart failure then peripheral arterial disease asthma i mean asthma nobody will make a mistake copd nobody will make a mistake uh, peripheral arterial disease nobody makes a mistake what you had to pick up in this question was the fact of decompensated heart failure is uh, when we do not give uh, beta blockers to the patient that was the main concept behind this uh, question and then uh, when do you not use calcium channel blockers so calcium channel blockers uh, uh, would not be recommended in patients who are having aortic stenosis cardiomyopathy again because they lower the bp aortic stenosis patient anyways having a low bp same is cardiomyopathy same is cardiogenic shock so we will not be using calcium channel blockers in these chaps and uh, uh, i mean these are like abc contraindications which i wanted to focus on and majority of M mcqs you know you will notice both in pharma and medicine will mainly revolve around these contraindications of beta blockers and which is why the answer to this question changed and that is why the answer turned out to be that of digoxin so i think we are sorted with question number 1 for today uh, i had a good opening but then uh, you know subsequently people just you know missed that pulmonary edema component the learning message is only this that in all precautions of arrhythmias check out whether bp is recordable or unrecordable is the patient in heart failure or not because if the bp is unrecordable then you know that there is no point of drugs you will straight away do either cardioversion or defibrillation and similarly if the person is in heart failure then you should manage and address the heart failure component because otherwise he will die because of that pink frothy sputum that develops so i hope that is a justification uh, uh, all arrhythmia mcqs may bp value must be checked findings of congestive heart failure must be checked if they are not there then not an issue you know you ask your standard you answer your standard drugs but if bp is crashing change over to from drugs to cardioversion or defibrillation as the case is if it's going to be heart failure then treat heart failure okay ji burgarda sign will be seen in which of the following so burgarda sign uh, uh, i think uh, everybody is uh, uh again making a mistake uh, brugada sign is a feature yep 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 you see brugada sign is something which is uh, a very characteristic feature uh, with respect to uh it's not brugada it's not brugada syndrome guys it's not brugada syndrome brugada sign is a feature which is uh, scn 5a and we are not talking about brugada syndrome okay so brugada syndrome will be having that st segment elevation that we have talked about in session 1 that is the co pattern or that biphasic wave that i had described earlier so no let's look at the remaining options uh, uh, in this particular question in fact there are very two close options uh, that we need to work out for brugada sign and uh, basically the concept behind brugada sign will be that it is uh, let me just explain what i mean by the word brugada sign and then it will become relatively easier for you uh, meaning of the word brugada sign will be that this is like a broad qrs you can notice that uh, there is a broad anything that goes up like this is going up so this is r and what is coming down is the s s component so what you can notice in this patient is a broad rs segment the red is the r and the s1 is going to be uh the s is going to be a uh, presentation uh, s is a down swing basically uh, if this broad rs is more than 100 milliseconds then the technical term that we use for that is called as brugada sign and uh, this brugada sign would be seen in uh, two uh, conditions uh, per se from this question's perspective one this broad rs complex is a feature that is seen in hyperkalemia and second it can also be seen in ventricular tachycardia but uh, the most appropriate answer where documentation of brugada sign as far as harrison is concerned is he has mentioned brugada sign for hyperkalemia in fact when i have described it even in my uh, routine lectures you know if you listen to the ecg findings in hypo and hyperkalemia i have mentioned a passing reference to that 
that the word used is Burgada sign and not Burgada syndrome. That would be a broad RS complex. In this question, there are two very close options, VT as well as hyperkalemia. And uh, the most appropriate correct answer for this one would be option number A, where we get presence of Burgada sign, which simply means a broad RS complex. And uh, yeah, there are in fact two answers in this question, hyperkalemia and ventricular tachycardia. I first put up prevalence wise, you know, that hyperkalemia yeah, is what you are more likely to get. And in fact, Harrison has mentioned first for hyperkalemia. So that is how it is. But like in uh, AIMS exam, where there are multiple correct options, then A and D, both of them should be answered for Brugada. It simply means uh, a, a broad RS complex. That's because of the, uh, uh, in, in ventricular tachycardia, we are having intermyocyte conduction. And that intermyocyte conduction is lower than the Purkinje conduction. So you get a broad RS complex. You see, heart rate is not dependent on QRS uh, complex duration. Heart rate is decided by RR interval. So in VT also, we get a broad RS. And in hyperkalemia anyway, you know, the, the potassium gradients will contribute to this uh, uh, intermyocyte conduction coming up, which again explains the Brugada component. Uh, the answer to this is A more than D as of now. And I also want to utilize this opportunity to once again remind you regarding this uh, shelf that always comes up in ventricular tachycardia. And uh, you'll always notice, no, this shelf appearance that comes up in uh, ventricular tachycardia. And that is what is called as Josephson sign. Uh, so you are now aware of Josephson sign for ventricular tachycardia. You are also aware of Brugada sign for ventricular tachycardia. And uh, at the same time, you can get uh, fusion beats and capture beats as well. The best way to solve a question with respect to great, great doctor, uh, great, I mean, if you got it correct, Brugada and uh, I mean the first two questions if you got them correct excellent you are just bang on spot to pick up those small nitty gritties that can be asked in the question and ventricular tachycardia basically has intermyocyte conduction that explains both of these findings uh, the the Brugada component and the Josephson the sign the shelf that comes up uh, we are sorted for this uh, question number two for today let's move on to the third one and uh, you again have to do and solve this question on the basis of exclusion uh, this one says, uh, yeah, a uh, six year old man is admitted with central chest pain and uh, then uh, the pain is radiating to the left arm of the patient. He's having a lot of sweating. He's is showing ST elevation. So I let you figure out uh, and absorb the question, right? ST elevation in one AVL V1 to V4. The thrombolysis in this chap was done and ECG was recorded after the thrombolysis was com completed. And uh, what you need to pick up is the findings in this question. Okay. Aha, uh -huh. thank you. Thank you. R. Fine. Let's work it out, guys. Polymorphic ventricular tachycardia is something that's more commonly seen with electrolyte imbalances like hypokalemia, hypomagnesemia. It's more a manifestation that is seen with drug toxicity. So, polymorphic ventricular tachycardia should be having variable amplitude of the broad QRS complexes. And uh, if you look at the height here, I don't think so that there is any disparity as far as the heights of uh, uh, the entire QRS. And then there are, you know, this uh, 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 downsloping uh, 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 ST depression also present in this patient. So this is not a feature of polymorphic ventricular tachycardia. And even if you're saying tachycardia, let's count the heart rate. No, I think that is the easier solution than we fighting it out regarding whether they are equal or not equal. Uh, let's just count it randomly anywhere, 1, 2, 3 and a little more than 3. So uh, I can say that I'm not dealing with the tachycardia because it's going a little more than 3. You know, I'll just zoom it in. You can see this is 1, this is 2, this is 3 and then it's going more than 3. So if it is going to be, this is 2, this, this is 1, this is 2, this is 3. So it's going to be more than 3 and then there is no tachycardia present in this guy. So all you have to pick up was what is the arrhythmia that is seen after thrombolysis. I mean, the question was regarding that statement that which arrhythmia is common after thrombolysis, which arrhythmia indirectly tells you that coronary artery is opened. Yes, guys, I think now I'm getting the correct answer for this one. You just have to rule out all the other options. VT will be having always a heart rate more than 100. And uh, in fact, A and B are dummy choices because it is written sustained and non-sustained. I mean, sustained would be more than 30 seconds and non-sustained would be less than 30 seconds. So as such, you know, in this particular strip, there is no duration given. I cannot find out whether for 30 seconds or more, I mean, they should give me time then, right? Or should count the number of boxes because only then I can identify that. So the point is that uh, they should give a long strip. They would have given a long strip for the question. 
uh, I'm ruling out A versus B because they don't have tachycardia. There's no duration also described. And polymorphic ventricular tachycardia, one should always be having a heart rate more than 100. That is one. And second, there should be variable amplitude of the broad QRS complexes. So this particular question was by exclusion. And uh, the answer is AIVR that is technically called as slow VT. Uh, slow VT is uh, referred as accelerated idioventricular rhythm. Uh, this is rather indirectly a good news because it tells us regarding the thrombolysis is working. Uh, it's a transitory rhythm that you see once you have started managing your case. So this would be uh, answered as option number C for this one that is AIVR that is idioventricular rhythm and there is no need of intervention in this case. I mean this is a benign uh, condition. Why we are calling it benign because the heart rate of the patient is turning out to be less than 100 and uh, this is just an evolving temporary phase. It's rather indirectly telling us that the drugs are working in this case. The main keyword in this question was thrombolysis was done. Traditionally, we do a percutaneous coronary intervention and after that he had shown regarding this uh, heart rate which was less than 100. Uh, there are three pointers in fact in this question for answer as AIVR. First pointer is thrombolysis. Second pointer is heart rate of this chap is less than 100 per minute and third is that broad RS complexes can be seen. So if I add up all of these, uh, doctor, we cannot comment on uh, the type of MI that the person had suffered from at the moment because what you can notice is very significant T wave inversions that are coming uh, which indicate that there was a definitive evidence of myocardial ischemia. But at least at this particular point of time in the visible current leads, we are not able to see any ST elevation which tells us that okay, at least whatever ST elevation was present uh, that had now resolved with intervention. So uh, with intervention of thrombolysis. So at the moment, there is no ST elevation that can be visualized, which is again good news because uh, the, our person, he, he stays on admission, there was an ST segment elevation and now it has, it has resolved. Uh, okay, the question came is how to differentiate between uh, sustained and non-sustained ventricular tachycardia. Sustained would be a duration more than 30 seconds and uh, non-sustained would be less than 30 seconds. How to solve that? Uh, well, you will need to count the number of total number of boxes and uh, about uh, for 6 seconds of ECG, they would be allowed about 30 large boxes. For 6 seconds, there would be 30 large boxes. So for 30 seconds, they would be like, you know, uh, I'll just write it, uh, 6 uh, uh, second CCG, if you have to scan, that would be about 30 large boxes. That That's approximately 30 large boxes. That's the routine data. So if I multiply by 5, that would be 30 and uh, 30 into 5, that would be 150 boxes. So if uh, arrhythmia is having a broad QRS tachycardia for more than 150 boxes, I'll say sustained. If it is less than 150 boxes, I'll say non-sustained. So I think that is how we'll solve it. Uh, Dr. Tanya, there is no intervention that is required. Sustained ki definition hai, 30 seconds se zyada, aur maine bakse bata hai, takriban 150 ke aspas ho jayenge. 6 seconds mein takriban 30, 30 bakse hote hain. Uh, there is no treatment uh, that is required for this patient uh, as, as of now. Uh, considering that hemodynamic instability is also not given in this case. So I think that he is on the way to recovery. This is a transitory phenomenon which has probably been captured. So I think we are sorted for uh, option number C for uh, as option number C for this question and uh, we move on to question number four. <laughs> okay, which of the following are used in management of non ST elevation? Uh, doctor, if it is sustained, then will uh, patient's BP will crash, no? So if it is non-sustained, it will stop on its own sometimes. But if it is a sustained VT, then you will have to take care of the crashing BP uh, by using a defibrillator. Uh, atropine, no, no, doctor. We will not use atropine in this patient. There is no intervention required for uh, AIVR. It's a good rhythm. Heart rate is between uh, 60 to 100. So there is no need of any atropine. Okay, so he says, uh, moving to the next one. Which of the following are used in management of a non-ST elevation uh, acute coronary syndrome? This is a broad term. This will incorporate two things. Uh, non-ST elevation ACS basically means non-ST elevation MI and unstable angina. The only difference between the two will be that in non-ST elevation MI, the biomarkers will be showing a very substantial rise. But in unstable angina, the biomarkers will be normal. I am giving a... Uh, uh, doctor, very very unlikely most of the time it is post thrombolysis that is documented. So we will have to look up literature if it is documented post that but post reperfusion is what is the standard textbook says. 
the difference between the two conditions is gonna be non ST elevation MI and uh, biomarker elevation versus biomarkers being normal. And let's look at answers. Uh, I am getting variable answers like uh, two, then I'm getting a three. So, uh, guys, uh, don't you use PCI in non ST elevation MI? I mean, in non ST elevation MI, no, you also do percutaneous coronary intervention. PCI is not use ST elevation MI. Mein use karte hi. Lekin non ST elevation MI mein bhi ultimately, patient ko, you know, if you are a can you can get a 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 platelet inhibitors are given. You know, the mnemonic that we traditionally use are like uh, uh, TB mon or AB mon or whichever way you want to use that like tirofaban or can griller these are intravenous antiplatelet drugs so if you have to take up an antiplatelet if you are giving an intravenous antiplatelet drug that means the patient will also be subsequently scheduled for a percutaneous coronary intervention so for the management of these patients and kya kya denge so to reduce the ischemia in this patient uh, we will be using metoprolol we have to give antiplatelet drugs because this is a platelet rich clot a platelet you see this is not a fibrin rich clot fibrin rich clot is st elevation mi this is a platelet rich clot so can griller will also be given so to neutralize the ischemia component beta blocker can griller to neutralize the platelets heparin because there is ultimately a clot getting formed in this patient and we also go in for pci guys even percutaneous coronary intervention is used in management of this condition the correct answer for this one is option number four all of them are used guys uh, you are mixing it with primary pci if I was writing, writing here primary percutaneous coronary intervention, then primary percutaneous coronary intervention is used in only ST elevation MI. The word primary is basically for usage in ST elevation MI. But then overall, we are using uh, percutaneous coronary intervention even for management of non-ST elevation MI also. No? They are, uh, it's not that we don't do PCI nowadays. PCI is done for both ST as well as for non-ST elevation myocardial infarction. So the correct answer for this one is option number four. Yeah. Uh, Mona is the initial treatment doctor that would not be the specific management it's an anti ischemia approach that we are using where we are not starting with morphine obviously we are starting with the why metoprolol uh, metoprolol is given to reduce the heart oxygen consumption single dose of beta blocker is given to uh, reduce uh, uh, the the consumption of oxygen uh, there are three anti ischemia agents no? and the anti ischemia agents that we use are nbm so, con con se anti ischemia agents use karte hain non ST elevation MI mein so nitrates use karte hain preload or afterload dono kam kar denge uske baad kaun sa anti ischemia agent use karte hain beta blocker use karte hain aur teesra jo hota hai wo morphine use hota hai so there are three anti ischemia agents which are used guys beta blocker dono type of MI mein dete hain and main abhi summary de dunga taki aapko yaad ho jaye but nitrates, beta blocker and enoxaparin are drugs which would be useful for uh, as anti ischemia agents per se. And uh, after using this anti ischemia approach then uh, subsequently we will be, yeah, yeah, we will be using all of them exactly. They'll, we'll also be using DAPT that is dual antiplatelet therapy will be given. Dual antiplatelet therapy would mean that we'll be giving aspirin loading dose and along with aspirin we'll be giving ticagrelor to the patient. That is a oral molecule. So uh, this is the initial approach on admission, NBM, aspirin, ticagrelor for cases of non-ST elevation MI and then uh, subsequently in our management we will be using intravenous uh, group 2B 3A platelet inhibitors. Uh, those are gonna be uh, from any one of the following, I will just mention the names here. The standard drugs that we use are like, uh, uh, we can use tirofiban, we can be using ftfibatide or we can be using uh, cangrelor. The, you can remember cangrelor as like brother of ticagrelor only. The only difference is one we are using oral, second we are using intravenously. And uh, then subsequently one the group 2B, 3A plated inhibitors have been scheduled. Uh, the next molecule that we, or the next approach that we will use in a high risk patient would be to go ahead with percutaneous coronary intervention. Uh, Epsiximab is another drug doctor but nowadays Epsiximab is not preferred. So in 6.0 I have emphasized that statement that instead of answering Epsiximab, if you can answer that as TBE, that is uh, Tirofiban, Ftifibadan, Cangrelor, then things would be relatively better. Uh, yeah, beta blockers will reduce the risk of post-MI arrhythmias. Uh, doctor, at the moment, I'm not worried about post-MI. I'm working about current MI and I want to reduce the oxygen consumption of the heart to reduce the infarct size. Abhi kya fayda hai beta blocker ka? Uh, beta blocker har MI mein dete hai, sirap bradycardia ke saath nahi dete. 
वाई यू गिव इट इज बिकॉज बाई डिक्रीजिंग द ऑक्सीजन कंजम्पन उससे जो इनफॉक्ट साइज है वो रिलेटिवली जो है वो कम हो जाएगा इट्स नॉट प्रोसूजर डॉक्टर इट्स टिकाग्रलर क्लोपिडोग्रल वी कैन गिव बट इट डज नॉट वर्क इन एशियन पेशेंट्स ना क्लोपिडो वी इंडियंस वी हैव दैट साइटोक्रोम फोर पी फोर फिफ्टी का सी बाय पी टू सी नाइनटीन पॉलीमोर्फिजम क्लोपिडोग्रल इज अ प्रो ड्रग इट इज नॉट कन्वर्टेड इन टू एक्टिव फॉर्मेट इन एशियन पॉपुलेशन द रीजन वाई इट्स नॉट कन्वर्टेड इज बिकॉज वी अवर साइट अवर लिवर साइटोक्रोम फी फॉर फिफ्टी सिस्टम इज नॉट वर्किंग एज इफेक्टिवली सो फॉर एशियन पॉपुलेशन इज सेज इंस्टेड ऑफ यूजिंग क्लोपिडोग्रल वी कैन बी यूजिंग टीकाग्रलर now a uh, difference is only that uh, percutaneous coronary intervention is the initial approach the primary means that you will straight away take up the patient for uh, uh, for uh, into the cath lab whereas in non stellation mi it's the drug treatment and based on the risk factors you are then going to evaluate the patient subsequently you see in stellation mi it is always going to be straight away that you have to take the patient into the cath lab so the approach is percutaneous coronary intervention but we add a prefix uh, primary because you need to ensure that this patient should be in the cath lab within 90 minutes of entry into the hospital or within 120 minutes of first medical contact uh, there are two different time zones that i mentioned it is 90 minutes from entry of the door of the hospital so 90 minutes is door to balloon time and 120 minutes would be first medical contact to the balloon time uh, first medical contact means like when the call came to the emergency number 112 or 911 in america so we are adding 30 minutes for the ambulance to bring the patient to the hospital and remaining 90 minutes for us to achieve uh, the vascular access using the femoral artery or a radial artery approach and then go ahead with the uh, balloon angioplasty so that's where the word primary is used as an initial approach if we work in a small place where cath lab facility is not available uh then we have alternative approaches available which is that we'll go ahead with thrombolysis in this particular case and uh, this is what we do for st elevation mi but if it is a case of non st elevation myocardial infarction slash unstable angina then in these patients what you do initially is you can remember with help of a mnemonic that is tbe mon or because mon is what is commonly taught in pharmacology so mona mon whatever you want us use here and the t here is standing for tirofeban which is a anti platelet drug uh, which is a group 2b 3a platelet inhibitor or instead of tirofeban in this question it was written cangrelar so any of the two molecules or even eptifibatide can be used uh, that mnemonic cbe can also be uh, identif identifiable and uh, once we have done it then we will evaluate whether he is a high risk patient or not like if this guy is already having uh, let me say blockages in his coronary artery and he has been suffering from chest pain episodes early he is also hypertensive he is also having diabetes mellitus then in these patients we will schedule a percutaneous coronary intervention which may sometimes be written as a delayed percutaneous coronary intervention the delayed word sometimes may not be written that delayed terminology may not be written but in high risk cases what i mean by high risk case if there is uh, multiple blockages in the coronary artery already documented you already had an angiogram done humne bola tha bypass kara lo he did not get a bypass done we said stenting kara lo double vessel disease tha we told him get a stenting done and he did not get it done that is why we are going to be useful for management of these patients and uh, yeah yeah harrison ka flow chart exactly i'm going to show you the flow chart for uh, non st elevation mi and even in non st elevation mi he says that uh, we can be going in for uh, immediate invasive percutaneous coronary intervention within as little as 2 hours so that's a new update that i want you guys to be familiar with and i'll write it on the previous slide that he says that uh, when it comes to non st elevation myocardial infarction in a high risk case this percutaneous coronary intervention again should be done within 2 hours that is 120 minutes so you can see that now pci is a common treatment for both of them you know if a cardiologist decides not to do a pci non st elevation mi that is his call but for our 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 uh, data it is that pci now is the treatment for both for it is a myocardial infarction so that's the basic summary that i've given in a single slide ki bhi percutaneous coronary intervention dono mein karte hain the only thing is if i say straight away primary that means that we are going to take up every case here we are not going to do stratification i'm not going to say low risk moderate risk high risk i mean all cases of st elevation mi are straight away taken into the cath lab but in non st elevation mi the cardiologist has to take a call should i take him up in the cath lab should i not take him in the cath lab that is why this hiccup is present that we call it a delayed percutaneous coronary intervention so i hope that makes it uh, understandable then you mentioned that why thrombolysis is contraindicated in unstable angina because unstable angina is a platelet rich clot 
you see this both things are basically platelet rich if you will do thrombolysis in a platelet rich clot it will not give any benefit rather it might cause bleeding so we don't use it and similarly in some massive pulmonary embolism there are multiple small clots for that the more effective approach is use heparin I mean, you would try to use the most appropriate therapy for the patient. Why to, you know, force and uh, use a drug which will not be advantageous to the patient. Uh, what extra do I, heparin prevents clot propagation, doctor? Prevents clot propagation. You upgrading antithrombin 3 activity, no? Platelet rich clot, you are not going to destroy by using heparin. That you will destroy by using tirofaban can killer, man. It, you are not just you are not taking care of the actual thrombus the platelet rich clot by giving heparin you are preventing clot propagation because it's going to keep on increasing suppose it is present in the left circumflex artery if it exceeds further it can reach up to led also that will affect the distal circulation uh, or downstream circulation as well so we'll uh, rather be more comfortable uh, handling these patients in the approach that i have currently shared before you the correct answer for this one is all the fo following options are correct and uh, I would suggest you to listen to non-ST elevation MI discussion because when it comes to any threat, they don't like asking usually ST elevation MI, they usually like asking non-ST elevation MI slash unstable engine and the treatment for both conditions is going to be same. Yeah, Timmy score, thrombolysis and myocardial infarction score, the name is Timmy score but that does not mean that you are doing thrombolysis. That Timmy score is just going to be uh, yeah, giving you an idea with respect to whether the person needs aggressive intervention or not. But that's the final summary in the shortest possible words that I can describe for what you are going to do and what you are not going to do for a case of myocardial infarction. Uh, CT angiography, yeah, in chronic stable angina, we do a coronary CT angiography. If uh, he says, how do you evaluate a chronic stable angina patient, then coronary CT angiography will be having a sensitivity of as much as 98%, which is more than anything else. It is more accurate than stress echocardiography. It is more accurate than... Uh, any other nuclear scan available whether you take up thallium stress or you take up system EV stress uh, or as compared to any of the other tests coronary CT angiography is the best one and uh, then overall the, the gold standard investigation the gold standard investigation is anyway invasive uh, coronary angiography and that invasive coronary angiography is uh, the one which is uh, the gold standard investigation because uh, you see when you tell somebody I'm gonna uh, take access through your radial through your femoral artery wo matlab karwane ke liye ready nahi hoga na so most of the time coronary CT angiography is the one which is to be used clot propagation uh, doctor dono mein hi jo main purpose hai that is to prevent the clot propagation and increase uh, the antithrombin 3 activity so heparin ka jo main use hai wo clot badhne se rokta hai a clip classification is not for mi doctor clip classification is for severity of congestive heart failure clip classification just tells you you know crepitations are present whether they are only at the basis or the whole of the lung fields are filled up filled up it's a, it's an artificial classification and um, nowadays i mean i would in any congestive heart failure i mean i would uh, uh, straight away start the treatment of that patient with lmnop rather than trying to get into a, a, a classification per se so clip is like only to grade the severity of acute congestive that too only acute not chronic acute congestive heart failure no, 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 absolutely not. No, 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 so uh, he is good uh, at driving but he has had a few minor accidents in the last couple of months and he says that which of the following would be uh, the best one for uh, evaluation of uh, or which one of the following is uh, correct about this condition. Yes, so the diagnosis of this particular case is Alzheimer's disease and uh, in Alzheimer's disease uh, the one that will increase the risk is going to be apolipoprotein 4. So this looks like an okay statement. Uh, uh, 2 does not increase the risk rather apolipoprotein 2 decreases the risk so that is why it is an incorrect statement then uh, increase levels of acetylcholine well that's the funny and thalamus and basal ganglia degeneration are also funny statements so it is just yeah epsilon e4 is the risk and e2 is protective that uh, dr mushahid khan has put up, put it up very very correctly that uh, what is protective for alzheimer there are only two things one is uh, apolipoprotein e2 so while I'm waiting for your answers here, can you tell me the, or while I'm writing this before you, 
can you tell me what else have you read is protective with respect to alzheimer's disease one is apo e2 and second okay i got one answer as smoking uh, anything else something better than that okay okay so uh okay okay doctor it is NSAIDs exactly that is what i wanted to say i mean though that smoking part is very skeptical but what is documented in the textbook what is written in the in harrison is yeah then, then there are like these query query things no like like coffee is gonna be protective and stuff like that so all of these are like you know clinical trials which will keep on going on and on it is what harrison says is what is protective are only two factors that is NSAIDs and foe2 are the only ones which are protected otherwise everything else is gonna cause the age advanced age is the worst uh, uh, risk factor for these patients uh, i mean everything else is gonna be <coughs> related to worsening of the case but protective part is FOE2 and NSAIDs uh, for diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease can you tell me the imaging modality which will help in diagnosis uh, okay I'll give you options also or uh, yeah yeah okay uh, without options let me know what test would be best for diagnosis of Alzheimer's for dementia obviously we use a mini mental score examination but I just wanted to know what scan would you like to do to evaluate Alzheimer's disease okay okay fine i'm getting a functional mri that's great great so something better than a functional mri okay we can do a hm power spec in a patient uh, yes guys overall the best one okay amyloid pet exactly guys uh, this is what is given in harrison he says that amyloid pet scan is overall the best way to identify the neurofibrillary tangles and uh, uh, the tau protein deposits uh, the, i mean amyloid pet is overall the best one the second one is obviously we can go ahead with the uh, functional mri so pet would always occupy the best spot that's what i will go by the textbook data like i even for the previous question i was saying that we'll have to go by whatever the textbook is saying like for high risk cases is saying doing a pci in 120 minutes i showed you the reference also in the same spirit uh, even here uh, there are two investigations that they have mentioned and then new drug for alzheimer quickly uh, can i have answers there it helps in actually not uh, in full-blown alzheimer mild moderate one uh, yeah, or severe one it will not work but then uh, you have uh, early onset alzheimer and you are giving that drug and it helps in further worsening of the patient so can i have the answer for the new drug that is available yes aducanumab exactly so this drug will not be working in case uh, yes this drug will not be working in those cases where already alzheimer has gone into a severe or a moderate form but uh, yes exactly aducanumab would mainly be working in those particular situations where uh, the disease has just started and you just want to prevent the further deterioration of this patient i mean traditionally you know we have been talking about drugs like rivastigmine we have been using transdermal patches uh, we have been using galantamine for the patient mimantin is always the best drug for this patient but then yes uh, aducanumab would be the one that uh, would be useful for management of these patients in a sense that it will prevent uh, the further deterioration so we started with five the correct answer for this one is option number a and uh, even in the earlier session in the morning session we had done a question on alzheimer's disease so that makes it a cause of two only yeah donipizil is the only one to be given in all the stages exactly most of the time we start with donipizil only okay yeah we have a reverse treatment patch now available uh which of the following investigations must be done for diagnosis of pseudo hlizia yes guys uh, waiting for your answer at the moment or the current question on the screen that would be pseudo hlizia uh the causes of pseudo hlizia okay uh doctor we'll start with uh, in all of them we'll start with donepezil uh, mild moderate and severe and uh, keep on adding drugs like rivastigmine galantamine to them okay so i'm getting four there as an answer that is upper gi endoscopy and then a high resolution manometry in a patient yes yes more people please uh, investigations to be done for diagnosis of this patient yes yes okay yes pseudo hlasia can be basically because of a malignancy like it could be a cancer of the fundus of the stomach which can go up and can contribute to pseudo hlasia findings and then along with that uh, another reason could be paraneoplastic manifestations uh 
Chagas disease is not pseudo achalasia. Chagas disease causes uh, esophageal involvement, heart involvement, genitourinary involvement. So that's a totally separate disorder. Pseudo achalasia causes are mainly two either either seen with lung cancer or it is seen with cancer fundus uh, uh, carcinoma uh, stomach carcinoma stomach. I mean carcinoma stomach or carcinoma fundus is uh, what is gonna be. The one that is responsible so i need to do an endoscopy in the case in any in in any case and uh, yeah that would be secondary hls yeah that's a more appropriately put term so to detect any cancer i will have to do a upper g endoscopy in this case uh, option number a is anyway selected out of three options in majority of the options you can see option number a is present and then we need to select something which is more reasonable subsequently so there are two close options that is a b and a d uh, option number B is endoscopic ultrasound. So uh, if I'm doing an endoscopy and if I'm using an endoscopic ultrasound, it will help me in increasing my diagnostic yield because sometimes the tumor may not be uh, very, very visible. Uh, the correct answer for this one is not A and D guys because see high resolution manometry in this guy would already have been done. The findings in this guy, when, when we say pseudo HLASIA is when already the diagnosis of the patient of HLASIA has been made on the basis of high resolution manometry. Now we need to prove the word pseudo here. Now we need to prove the word pseudo in this case. This basic question is on the concept that HLASIA findings of uh, high resolution manometry are already present in this case. That is, we are finding that the tone of the lower esophageal sphincter is increased. What we are also finding in this patient is a peristalsis in the lower segment. So that is already documented by high resolution manometry. Now we need to prove that it is pseudo. So the two investigations that would help me here are upper G endoscopy and then an endoscopic ultrasound. Why I said endoscopic ultrasound is because lots of time the tumor may not be visible on getting into the wall and it might be present inside the wall and therefore endoscopy report might turn out to be falsely normal. Uh, yeah, endoscopy, we to endoscope, you need in endoscopy, you should be able to see a tumor fungating into the lumen of the esophagus. If the tumor is on the outside, you know, the carcinoma stomach cancer might infiltrate from the outside of the esophageal wall, it may not be seen of, uh, when you're putting a scope inside. So there's a high probability you can miss it. So for lesions, which are relatively, uh, you see, uh, uh, in the deeper parts of the esophagus or towards the periphery of the esophagus when there is an enroaching tumor endoscopic ultrasound would be required then uh, dr yatri said why not a barium swallow so barium swallow to sir is not at all sensitive for diagnosis of even hlasia forget about pseudo hlasia because what they teach in radiology that classical you know that bird beak defect and the sigmoid appearance all those are like you know highly exaggerated findings in reality i mean most patients would present much more earlier than that so that barium swallow that sigmoid esophagus that we see or that uh, sigmoid, sigmoid appearance that we see and that uh, classical uh, you know uh, bird beak aspects etc that or would be explained to you they are the ones which are which are uh, totally uh, i mean not at all sensitive so c can never be the answer for this question because of lack of sensitivity d is not the answer because hlasia already has been documented in this chap now i need to prove that there is a possible tumor contributing to it if the tumor is not visible on endoscopy then i can put in a ultrasound probe attached to it and i can locate the tumor by looking inside the uh, wall per se uh what if we cause seeding of the tumor seeding of tumor by endoscopy <laughs> no 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 we don't cause any seeding of the tumor by endoscopy we do seeding by doing a biopsy right when we do a biopsy that is where the seeding will occur uh doctor that would not be a very sensitive one to differentiate between the two uh, nitrates work in even hls cardia as well and uh, both calcium channel blockers so i think we'll go by what the textbook says upper g endoscopy and endoscopic ultrasound and uh, the answer to this question would be option number one uh, between one and four i know that you know four you answered because you thought ki hls cardia to hame document karne hai. but the point is it's asking about pseudo hls and it's telling you that how do you identify the tumor which may be present submucosally it might be present uh, in the deeper layer or on the exterior part of the esophagus sixth is sorted let's move on to the seventh one uh, this one says uh, in a patient with the mitral stenosis loud s1 becomes soft in all of the following except uh, a repeat one and uh, I think you would be able to get this one right. 
पैरानियोप्लास्टिक या बिकॉज द लंग कैंसर वुड हैव ऑल्सो स्प्रेड नो इन द डीपर लेयर्स ऑफ द ईस ऑफ आई गेस सो पैरानियोप्लास्टिक कैन बी पिकड अप एंड या लॉट्स ऑफ टाइम पैरानियोप्लास्टिक माइट बी रिक्वायरिंग अ पेट सिटी फॉर डेमोस्ट्रेशन ऑफ द ओरिजिनल लंग कैंसर ओके सो इफ इट इज कैल्सिफाइड माइट्रोसिनोसिस देन इट विल बी सॉफ्ट इन हार्ट ब्लॉक बिकॉज देर विल बी अ ब्रैडी कार्डिया then bradycardia will be also contributing to soft because the intensity is related to the speed of the closure so let's just work out which conditions would be having a loud s1 and which will be having a soft s1 so calcified is always soft the explanation for soft s1 and calcified is the mobility of the valve is less that is why it is soft bradycardia the speed is less that is why it is soft in aortic regurgitation the pressure gradient will be reduced na I mean, this is happening in diastole. Like you know, this is the standard diagram that I have told for mitral stenosis. So mitral stenosis operates on this pressure gradient like this. This is diastole. And now what is happening in this patient is that there is some blood leaking across the aortic valve leaflets also. Like this blood is coming back here. So that is going to reduce the gradient because the gradient is LA minus LV. The gradient in mitral stenosis is LA minus LV. and if you are going to have this blood which you can see is coming from the aorta back into the left ventricle then this value will go up and if this value will go up the mathematical gradient will become lesser and if the gradient will become lesser it will still become relatively soft so the point is there is only one of them that would be having a loud one and that was uh, mild mitral stenosis the correct answer to this one is option number a for option number c i would like you to refer to this line diagram that i made mitral stenosis me jo uh, jo first start sound hoti hai that is based on the because if the valve will open with more force it will close also with more force if it will open with more force because there is an obstruction no so pressure in the atria is more atrial pressure is high in mitral stenosis cases but it's a gradient which is causing it and now the gradient will become relatively lesser because the blood is coming back into the lumen of the left ventricle so lv pressure will rise and the gradient will become less if these gradients become equal equal then uh, the valve will open with less force if it will open with less force the closure will also be relatively slow that is why the answer to this one is option number a let's move on to the eighth one which drug would not be used in the rhythm disorder which is shown below so yes guys uh, rhythm disorder which is shown below let uh, and i think you can pick up the rhythm disorder once again where you can notice uh, the variation in the rr interval of the patient so waiting for you guys to comment for this question uh, this is a rhythm strip for atrial fibrillation and is saying which of the following drugs would not be useful yes guys yes uh, hemant you are right the only thing i would like to modify in your question is that uh, aortic stenosis will be contributing to a soft right a soft value of soft s1 okay no aortic regurgitation would be a soft s1 aortic stenosis mein to basically they would be concentrating hypertrophy of the heart na yes 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 so uh because this patient is having a variable rr interval as you can see in this uh, representation a uh, variable rr interval so the once more we are discussing about atrial fibrillation and he says what drug should not be used in this patient uh we use beta blocker we use verapamil diltiazem we use amiodron but we do not use adenosine for this patient uh adenosine kyun nahi dete hain main uska reason bhi aapko bataunga abhi lekin abhi basic concept yahi hai ki irregular rr interval has come up in the ecg again and uh, yes it's a rapid ventricular response in this case why we do not use uh, why we do not use uh, adenosine in this patients is primarily because of the fact that lot of patients of atrial fibrillation might be having a bypass tract in their heart the bypass tract that are currently shown in this slide line diagram is the bundle of cant and uh, this bundle of cant at the moment is not conducting the impulses are going directly into the av node and directly going into the uh fascicles and therefore the ventricles are contracting very fast also now if by mistake if i give adenosine to this patient then what adenosine will do is that it will block the conduction at the level of the av node and if you block the conduction at the level of the av node then the impulses of the sa node will directly go via the bypass tract and will cause a uh, excitation of the ventricles relatively faster and this will cause atrial fibrillation to get converted into ventricular fibrillation then the atrial fibrillation 
विल गेट कन्वर्टेड इन टू वेंट्रिकुलर फेब्रिलेशन तो आपको अडिनोसिन नहीं देना होता है वाई बिकॉज लॉट ऑफ पेशेंट्स ऑफ एट्रल फेब्रिलेशन कुड बी एक्चुअली हैविंग अ हिडन बाईपास ट्रैक्ट इन द हार्ट दिस इज वॉट द स्टैंडर्ड डेटा इज द ओनली ओनली सीनैरियो जो मैंने पढ़ाया है जहाँ पे एट्रियल फेब्रिलेशन जो है इट कैन कॉन्ट्रीब्यूट टू कन्वर्जन इन टू वेंट्रिकुलर फेब्रिलेशन ओनली सीनैरियो वेर एट्रल फेब्रिलेशन कैन डी जनरेट इन टू वेंट्रिकुलर फेब्रिलेशन इज वेयर अ पर्सन इज हैविंग अ बाईपास ट्रैक्ट इन द हार्ट दैट इज वुल्फ पार्किसन वाइट सिंड्रोम सो इफ वी आर गोना introduce a high grade av block at the level of uh, av node by giving adenosine then this uh, conduction can become the same and uh, beta blockers no no doctor beta blockers would be acting on the sa node no beta blocker do not act on the av node beta blocker act on the sa node and they decrease the conduction system per se so ho jayega theek ho jata it's over a period of time that you need to get the options right lekin ye to repeat question hai yaar this is uh, i think november uh, last year or november previous to this one i'm not sure about the year but this is a repeat question that you are gonna remember uh, that adenosine nahi dete isko exclusion se nikal lo na isme itna logic mein lagane ki zarurat hi nahi hai atrial fibrillation mein amidron dete hain you give amidron for management of uh, uh, rhythm control and beta blocker mirapamil are given for rate control in the patient so what you don't read is adenosine which is specifically used for psvt and uh, the question is on atrial fibrillation so if i keep things simple the answer is by exclusion also if you want to get into the technicals ki sir aisa kya ho jayega agar aap adenosine de doge to he says adenosine can unmask adenosine can unmask a, a hidden bundle of cant which might cause detrimental which may turn out to be detrimental to the patient so uh, if you want to go the traditional textbook way i have the diagram in front of you you are giving adenosine you are cutting off uh, this conduction at the level of the av node and that is when you will force the uh, the impulses to go directly into the ventricles and degeneration of atrial fibrillation into ventricular fibrillation so that is one of the possibilities otherwise the standard data is more than sufficient for this both of these questions are repeat sir 7th and the 8th one so pyqs or pyts as they say here so even the options have not been modified those some questions that i'm giving you are having modified options but the remaining ones are like the standard ones only okay moving to the next question a patient is on a drug for management of heart failure and he says based on the ecg findings in this chap which of the following would be correct uh let's have quick voting here okay good good khan you did the right job paras has answered dr jaya has answered correctly you see all you have to pick up in this particular ecg is uh, the presence of normal sinus rhythm this is nsr pqrst pqrst this is normal sinus rhythm and uh, along with that you have to pick up this broad slurred r and s wave that's a pvc again that broad r and that slurred s presents that's a pvc so what is happening in the ecg of this patient is normal sinus rhythm pvc normal sinus rhythm pvc and that makes the diagnosis of this guy as uh, ventricular bigemini the probable drug that this patient may be on is digoxin if i look at uh, option number a for this question polymorphic ventricular tachycardia then most of the time polymorphic ventricular tachycardia would be seen with antiarrhythmic drugs and antiarrhythmic drugs that can cause this are usually class 1a or class 1c so uh the question mentioned heart failure the question did not mention antiarrhythmic drugs so as such uh, i can rule out option number a uh ventricular bigemini is seen with digoxin we all know that and that is what is documented here and for hypokalemia then i should be having a, a presence of a st depression uh, there should be a presence of a t wave inversion as well which uh, is not visible in any one of the leads and uh, for hyperkalemia i should be documenting a st elevation i should be having a tall tented t waves so uh, the tall tented t waves are not documented in this case the height of the t wave if i check looks pretty decent less than 5 mm so as such uh, there is no uh, risk for presence of uh, any electrolyte imbalances in this patient but yeah in the previous uh, cases in the exam he has mentioned about a patient on heart failure drug it could be diuretic and he can ask you regarding the uh, possibility of ecg findings of hypokalemia as well or he could mention that the patient is on ace inhibitor like chronic congestive heart failure patient is on ace inhibitor and then he can give you a finding of uh, elevated potassium because his kidneys have also been damaged uh, patient can have ventricular bigemini without digoxin yes doctor very much possible hypoxia is one big trigger 
ischemic heart disease can contribute to any arrhythmia so and in fact a much more common cause why by gemini can be triggered can be because of ischemic heart disease in fact one of the leading causes for development of premature ventricular contractions pvcs occur primarily isolated pvcs again and again they are usually seen in patients with cad coronary artery disease answer to question number 9 is option number b a uh, bp will begin to decrease doctor patient will start feeling having a fast beating heart but at the same time dizziness will come the reason for dizziness is because it's a premature ventricular contraction so heart will not get filled with blood properly if the heart will not get filled with blood properly the input and output both will be hampered and uh, that's why the dizziness will come in the patient yes the treatment for patient is lignocaine uh, for treatment of ventricular bigemini the preferred drug that we'll be using is lignocaine if it is not lignocaine we can even use phenytoin for the patient then is perioral numbness and tingling uh, this is a feature that is always seen with hypocalcemia so hypoparathyroidism will be having low calcium understandable uh, hyperphosphatemia the problem is phosphate chelates calcium and because it chelates calcium so that is why the calcium in the patient will tend to become less in pancreatitis also we always have you know in ransom scoring in pancreatitis we always read about calcium becoming subsequently low because of the pancreatic enzymes uh, which are going to be released in the peritoneal cavity they are going to cause uh, calcium to be leached on or calcium values usually are lesser in acute pancreatitis also as we read in ransom the correct answer for this one is uh, yeah saponification as they say the correct answer for this one is option number a vitamin d toxicity where calcium would be relatively high yes the saponification is a more appropriate word that i was searching for uh, calcium is not the treatment for torsades de pointesi torsades de pointesi is a arrhythmia which occurs because of magnesium magnesium uh, is a uh, less magnesium is a trigger for uh, the sodium potassium uh, uh, sodium potassium atp pumps are malfunctioning because of deficiency of magnesium or magnesium uh, levels are low i mean that malfunction is primarily a magnesium deficiency so we treat it by giving magnesium sulfate in the case and not calcium okay answer to this one is a uh, we are now on the next question which is an absolute yeah okay uh, it can be subjective uh, sometimes you know some questions look easier some look more difficult uh dr daisy if it is due to digox see if digox if he says digoxin toxicity is triggered by a diuretic and he says that what is the first line treatment then it is kcl as an answer uh, why because most of the time digoxin toxicity is triggered by concomitant hypokalemia so first we give potassium chloride we bring the potassium back to normal and then we give lignocaine to the patient so first answer would be uh, no no doctor we are not talking about magnesium for digoxin we are talking about magnesium for why magnesium is used in torsades de pointes and the logic is that hypomagnesemia causes uh, sodium potassium atps pumps to malfunction so bringing up the magnesium values will restore the electrical gradients okay so absolute criteria in this case is one you should be able to pick up the scolex uh, like in this particular image you can see the scolex present there and uh, uh, this tells you that the worm is developing or the larva is uh, developing in the brain so one of the absolute criteria is uh, neuroimaging showing evidence of eccentric hypodensity uh, eccentric uh, uh, lesion present i mean the whiteness is where the larva is going to be and then there's a the eccentric lesion in the periphery uh, everywhere you know if you check out it's always slightly in the periphery so there's an eccentric lesion it's not starry sky it's the eccentric dot which is the characteristic feature of the scolex which is developing because calcification the brain can be having multiple reasons calcification can be seen even with the uh, tubercular meningitis calcification can be present with even tuberculomas so i mean this particular ct is not diagnostic because it can be seen with multiple other conditions of intracranial calcification but if i see this eccentric lesions like the one that you're seeing on the your screen at the moment that's very very characteristic of neurocysticercosis or i need a tissue diagnosis but tissue diagnosis i mean i can do a biopsy and that biopsy can then show the presence of the parasite so there are two absolute criteria for diagnosis of ncc that is brain biopsy the tissue diagnosis or development of this uh, uh, eccentric lesion uh, i cannot call it uh, a ring enhancing lesion because there is no contrast uh, based image given there there are two images present here one is a ct one is a mri 
but there's no contrast that is visible at the moment so i can say that uh, the eccentric dot is the more specific answer in this case and the correct answer for this one is uh, option number a and d that would be point number three a b and c yeah that is what i'm saying why b is not the answer in this question is because calcification i mean intracranial calcification can be due to multiple reasons one of the leading reasons for intracranial calcification can be a tuberculoma then even cerebral toxoplasmosis can contribute to subsequently a intra like aids positive patient they can have uh, cerebral toxoplasmosis they can end up with intracranial calcification which would be scattered in the brain parenchyma so because it's not very conclusive that is why it's not included here meningioma mein to single hoga na meningioma mein to single calcified lesion hoga but is type ke jo scattered lesions ki main baat kar raha hu when this kind of scattered lesions in the brain where we can get calcification are like neurocystis or cosis then could be tuberculoma of tuberculoma meningitis and then is cerebral toxoplasmosis so considering that there are three differentials which are present for the scattered lesions that are of calcification that's why i have justified this yeah yeah we'll do it in a dead patient agreed agreed but absolute criteria mein to wo yahi word hai na absolute criteria yahi hai jo absolute criteria hai na usme wo kehta hai histological demonstration of the parasite या फंडस एग्जामिनेशन करो यही तो समझाना था आपको कि भाई ये जो एब्सुलट क्राइटेरिया पूछ रहा है वो डेड पर्सन में करेंगे वो मैं मानता हूँ कि बड़ी प्रैक्टिकल सी बात नहीं है बट एब्सुलट क्राइटेरिया आर द वन इज आस्किंग दैट या तो आप डेमोस्ट्रेशन ऑफ पैरासाइट फ्रॉम द ब्रेन और द स्पाइनल कॉर्ड लीजन इन द पेशेंट और फंडस एग्जामिनेशन और फॉर दैट मैटर ऑफ फैक्ट और डेमोस्ट्रेशन ऑफ कोलेक्स विद इन द सिस्टिक रीजन सो दीज आर थ्री विच आई हैव बेसिकली डिस्क्राइब बिफोर एंड वाई बी वॉज नॉट एन आंसर इज दिस विदाउट अ डिस्टर्बर स्ट्रोनेक्स अब देखो ना यहाँ पे सिर्फ एक ऐसे वाइट लीजन था विदाउट अ डिसर्नेबल स्कोलेक्स एंड इन वन सी में व्हाट इज प्रेजेंट इज दैट देयर वाज अ स्कोलेक्स प्रेजेंट इन द पेरीफ्री सो दैट डॉट इज द करेक्टरिस्टिक फीचर एंड द वाइट द होल थिंग वाइट दैट कैल्सिफिकेशन इज नॉट अ डायग्नोस्टिक फीचर एंड एब्सोलूट क्राइटेरिया Yeah, Subhash. Uh, it's only academic. Uh, you know, he is not asking practical. Practical, so neuroimaging criteria are there. Clinical criteria are there, na? By clinical criteria, me, so I antibodies do. The clinical diagnosis is. The clinical diagnosis is not asked. Clinical diagnosis, me, so I antibody. I will do. I will do lumbar puncture. I will do lumbar puncture. I will check for neurocyst. I will check for neurocystis cirrhosis antigen in the CSF of the patient, or I can check for antibody. तो वहाँ तो मैंने आपको आई मीन आई टॉक अबाउट यू नो द फर्स्ट इन्वेस्टिगेशन दैट आई टॉट यू फ्रॉम द क्लिनिकल परस्पेक्टिव इज आई डू अ लंबर पंक्चर एंड आई बी डिटेक्टिंग अ न्यूरो सिस्टी सर्कोस एंटीजन और आई कैन चेक फॉर एन एंटीबॉडी प्रेजेंट प्लस द पर्सन वुड बी लिविंग इन अ पोर सोशल इकोनॉमिक स्टेटस सो आई डिस्क्राइब दू नो आई डिस्क्राइब द रिक्शा पुलर इन माई रोटीन डिस्कशन ऑफ न्यूरो सिस्टी सर्कोसिस तो वो क्लिनिकल क्राइटेरिया नहीं पूछा ना सर वो एब्सलूट क्राइटेरिया पूछा तभी तो ये क्वेश्चन मैं आपसे डिस्कस कर रहा हूँ कि एब्सलूट वाले में वो बोलता है कि भाई ये प्रैक्टिकल बात नहीं है बट absolute is purely academic he has put up that in the exam and that is why uh, we have to you know remember this information nahi nahi aapko sirf ye wala ek to clinical wala jo main samjhaya hu case usko focus karna hai and second is ki isme dekho na sirf do hi to point hai ye wala to standard aapko pata hi hai scolex wala sirf do hi to aur point hai ek hai fundus pe matlab socho worm jo hai fundus mein chala gaya to sub retinal uh, cysti circus present or for that matter of fact a histological demonstration from like the person developed paraplegia and spine surgery was required spine surgery mein to specimen ho hi sakta na ki spine surgery karni padi because person was having paraplegia due to involvement of the thoracic spine so that in that specimen the pathologist is able to demonstrate the presentation of the parasite that will make it relatively easier for you okay so i think we sorted for question number 11 and we can move on to the 12th one where he'll give you a spirometric parameter and then you'll be expected to comment on the final diagnosis for this one no no uh, himanshu absolute does not mean a definitive diagnosis absolute just means in english science that it is proving 100% guarantee that it is cystic cirrhosis only biopsy is the best evidence any time for any pathological lesion no 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 rice grain calcification is not an absolute criteria because uh, you know that calcification the muscles can be seen even with the lipoma I mean, if you are having any localized lesion, uh, that can have a calcification present. Okay, guys, uh, let's move on to the next one, which is uh, was a good healthy discussion. Anyway, I I liked uh, your questions there. So Subhash, I think I I explained that to you. Okay, let's solve this one. Uh, the FEV one of the patient is sixty percent, uh, which is low. 
it is only 60 percent i mean fev1 normal value should always be more than 80 percent and in this mcq it is only 60 percent so i've written low then tlc of this patient is only 75 percent that is also low i mean I, I i can assume that tlc of the patient would be uh in the range of about an average value of 100 it's actually 90 to 110 but i'm saying about 100 percent tlc should be six liter and in this case the total lung capacity of the patient is low so at this moment uh what i can pick up in this question is that uh, this cannot be a question on bronchiectasis because bronchiectasis in a, is an obstructive uh, lung disorder and in obstructive lung disorder the tlc of the patient is either normal or can be increased also but tlc is not low in uh, patients who are having obstructive airway disease now i'm left with the remaining two options idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis and sarcoidosis for this question so let's work up those two options as well idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis the highlight of this condition is that there would be decreased total lung capacity that is okay but at the same time in these patients the shrinkage of the lung should also cause a reduction in the residual volume of this patient uh, guys uh, if you look at the data the answer is not idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis why it is not idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis because residual volume is 120 percent let me just write down the values before you dlco more than how much is normal then dlco more than 75 percent is always taken to be normal in this question the dlc of the patient is 80 percent that means it is in the normal range if it was pulmonary fibrosis just think logically if it is fibrosis in the patient then fibrosis may throw dlc you cannot be lesser the fibrosis may throw dlc will always be lesser because fibrosis may throw diffusion hoi nahi paega another reason why the answer to this question is not idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis is because residual volume jo hoti hai residual volume is uh, always reduced in interstitial lung disease but in this particular case residual volume is rather increased so that is the cause of concern also because residual volume ke jo average agar laga ke chalte hain that would be something like 1.2 liters here it is rather 120 percent of normal so it is increased that is ruling out the options guys yes can i have the answer now can i have the answer now sarcoidosis may be obstructive airway disease hota. mostly to sarcoidosis can be having obstructive as well as restrictive and this mcq is neither obstructive because a ko maine rule out kar diya and this question cannot be restrictive also because there is low residual increased residual volume in this case the correct answer for this one is neuromuscular disease that is myasthenia gravis i want you to think logically and now tell me myasthenia gravis mein to muscles ka weakness hota na if you ask a guy with myasthenia gravis to breathe out if you ask a guy with myasthenia gravis to breathe out because there is muscle weakness will he be able to breathe same out of air out of his lungs like you and me yes guys quick answer if you ask a myasthenia gravis patient to breathe out as hard as he can like you and me can breathe out will he be able to breathe out like you and me no if he will breathe less air out of his lungs then the air remaining behind in the lungs will be increasing so in myasthenia gravis you will always be having a increased residual volume you will always be having a increased residual volume which was the main pickup point in this particular question and uh, therefore the answer for this question is option number d the final summary for you guys is like this that anytime you get a question on spirometry parameter what are you supposed to do you are supposed to check out the fev1 you are supposed to check out the total lung capacity residual volume and the dlco in the patient if it is gonna be asthma then in asthma cases fev1 will obviously be less but the total lung capacity of the patient the total lung capacity of the patient will be normal to increase the reason for that is presence of air trapping in the lungs of these patients then residual volume in these patients well uh, even in asthma if he is having an attack then during an attack the residual volume can be increased and dlco in these patients will again be increased so in asthma patients uh, yes guys asthma is a condition where dlco is increased the reason for that is increased vascularity around the lungs asthma mein ye khud mein question hai ki what happens to dlc when asthma answer this as increased due to increased vascularity of lungs so in obstructive airway disorders will repeat once again fev1 is less dlc is increased due to air trapping residual volume is also more because of air trapping and dlc is also increased due to increased vascularity of lungs let us now compare this with interstitial lung disease interstitial lung disease is pulmonary fibrosis so fev1 will be less 
एफ पी वी वन इज लेस इन एस्तमा दैट इज ओके बट इट इज ऑल्सो लेस इन पेशेंट्स विद पलमरी फाइब्रोसिस क्योंकि लंग छोटा है इफ द लंग इज गोना बी स्मॉल लेस एयर इज गोना बी गोइंग आउट एंड इन दीज पेशेंट्स टी एल सी विल बी लेस रेजिडल वॉल्यूम विल बी लेस एंड डी एल सी यू विल बी लेस एंड नन ऑफ दीज पैरामीटर्स वर गेटर गेटिंग सेटिस्फाइड देन कम्स न्यूरो मस्कुलर डिसऑर्डर इन न्यूरो मस्कुलर डिसऑर्डर बिकॉज द चेस्ट मसल्स आर नॉट स्ट्रॉन्ग द एफ पी वी वन ऑफ द चैप इज लेस but the tlco in these patients residual volume can be increased as compared to normal and dlco will most of the time be normal like it happened in this particular case so you need to be able to differentiate between these permutation combinations and uh, these these datas that i have mentioned i mean you know at the moment they look relatively easy to understand when i'm writing that in the form of a table but in the exam when he gives us those values that is when errors of judgment can be coming and because it is going to be any set anyway so he's not going to ask you obstructive and restrictive airway disorders but he's going to ask you extra parenchymal restrictive lung disease एक्स्ट्रा पैरनकाइमल मतलब लंग के बाहर है दैट इज कॉन बी न्यूरोमस्कुलर डिसऑर्डर दैट कॉन बी द वन दैट आर करेंटली हाईलाइटेड द करेक्ट आंसर टू दिस क्वेश्चन इज ऑप्शन नंबर डी नहीं नहीं और कोई एक्सेप्शन नहीं है बस यही एक्सेप्शन है जो आपको पढ़ना है और इन्हीं सेट यार थोड़ा मुश्किल होता है तो इस वजह से द क्वेश्चन वुड बी अ लिटल ट्रिकियर वन चलो ईजी कर देते हैं आपके लिए ओके ओके Uh, total lung capacity okay okay total lung capacity in patients yeah yeah it should be relatively lesser yes it so would not be increased total lung capacity would be lesser because he will not be able to breathe in no chest muscles are weak so he will not be able to breathe in so tlc would be lesser agreed agreed this was adrenaline rush to focus on that dlco component focus on the res uh, residual volume component it is the rv which is the distinguishing factor for these you know the increase or the decrease values that i have highlighted yes 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 neat is more about you know neat is long distance way, swimming it's more about facts and in any set it's more scuba diving you know how long can you hold your breath and can you do deep breathing uh, under the under the sea for a long duration so i mean that is what is uh, the one that is recommended uh, i hope dr now is satisfied uh, that is sorted for tlc for neuromuscular disease okay ji let's move on to the next one a uh, 70 year old patient uh, he is on epixaban for non valvular atrial fibrillation and is having this uh, face weakness uh, arm weakness and leg weakness for last 3 hours so there is a presentation of stroke the bp in this chap is elevated 170 by 100 is really high uh, considering that uh, this guy is suffering from stroke so i'm a little worried for this bp values though not reaching that critical value 185 by 110 it is can shows a hyperdensity in the posterior limb of the internal capsule so uh, the diagnosis of this patient is a intracerebral hemorrhage and he says that which of the following will be uh, required for the management of this condition uh, the reason for the intracerebral hemorrhage in this particular case is apixaban so i need to select a drug which is going to be neutralizing the apixaban toxicity and uh, yes guys it is not a i'll not give eltaplase to this patient because eltaplase se to hemorrhage aur zyada bad jayegi eltaplase would be contraindicated in this case i'd not lower the bp in this particular case because lowering the bp will reduce the perfusion of the brain you see a uh, cerebral perfusion pressure is a difference of systolic blood pressure minus intracranial pressure in this particular chap uh intracranial pressure is rising that is why body is causing increase of systolic bp also and that is why the perfusion of the brain is getting maintained so if i will lower the bp with nicardipine it will worsen the con condition of this patient we don't need to lower the bp suppose it was 220 by 130 then i'll plan to lower the blood pressure but at 170 by 100 i don't need to lower because it will worsen the cerebral perfusion pressure the formula is here in front of you mechanical thrombectomy is done in acute ischemic stroke so the correct answer for this particular patient is option number c that is the antidote basically is asking you in simple english what is the antidote for apixaban toxicity and the answer is adixanat alpha which is uh, yes recombinant modified factor 10a protein so apixaban toxicity uh is the main treatment for this patient i mean andixanat alpha is the answer for this question uh well uh, as far as the cut off for starting hypertens anti hypertensis is concerned if it is going to be uh, acute ischemic stroke for ischemic stroke it is going to be 185 by 110 
In hemorrhagic stroke, we need to lower only if it is 220 by 130. We do not lower BP because of this uh, impact of the formula that I have currently explained here before you. Yes, 185 by 110 is for AIS and this case is not of AIS also. No? So that's another reason why I would not like to lower the BP in this particular case. The question is simple one liner. How do you handle uh, Pixab and toxicity? It is and Dixon and Alpha for this patient. No, no, Dr. Hemant will not lower the BP because of the formula aspect that I explained to you, no? like 170 by 110, even if it was 180 by 100, uh, will still not be or will be not very ready to lower the blood pressure because it's okay to keep the uh, systolic BP on the higher side. The moment you lower it, perfusion decreases. Well, listen to the stroke part, guys. In brain hemorrhage, it's always uh, 220, otherwise it's 185 by 110. Yeah, permissive hypertension as Samir has put up rightly. Okay, let's move on to the next one. Uh, yes, Dr. Shaw, I, I can understand if you have a night duty today. Uh, hats off to your dedication <laughs> that before a duty you are attending a session. Okay, guys. Yeah, nemodipin is given to reduce cerebral spasm, doctor, but it is done only after uh, in subarachnoid hemorrhage after we have done. Uh, angiography and we have put uh, uh, we have put that endovascular coil only after that nemodipin is used yes antidote is uh, yeah, yeah 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 the antidote is uh, why thrombolysis not done doctor this is not a case of thrombolysis now uh, this is not a case of uh, acute ischemic stroke that is why thrombolysis ni karing na uh, then there is nothing to left to save the patient he will be crippled he will totally be crippled Mechanical thrombectomy is done. Sir, guys, this question is not an acute ischemic stroke. Please read it. It is not hypodensity. It is hyperdensity. It is having a bleeding in the brain. Option A and option D are used for management of acute ischemic stroke. This chap is not having acute ischemic stroke. That is why the answers are turning out to be different. The correct answer is C. Delta plus the bleeding or the bad the next question is uh, doctor there is no treatment subsequently uh, uh, prevention is better than cure whenever we are prescribing no acts to the patient oral anti-clotting drugs we should always teach the patient uh, with respect to the dosage of the drug being proper lots of time chemists may play a spell sport and they might be giving a double dose tablet to the patient saying that take it half off because they'll get more commission on saying uh, selling a higher higher uh, you know higher uh, strength tablet uh, per tablet they get more money so they might be giving you know a double strand tablet telling the patient take half off he did not understand that and uh, this can result in problems in the longer run uh, thickened ventricular wall with normal diastolic function uh, doctor i did not get your query this is usually a feature that's seen with hypertension okay so let's wait for the answers in this one yeah, Dr. Prats, though these are the topics that I am focusing on. All these questions that I have discussed today, two questions on atrial fibrillation, the brain hemorrhage perspective, the spirometric analysis, those are the common topics which I would like you to use. So uh, if uh, at the end of this, I mean, you, in the description of the video, a link will be given. And in that link, you click, you'll get a PDF. And that PDF will be having a list of all these topics that I've discussed and they are the ones which I think should be revised for at least two days if you give giving to medicine or like one day if you're giving to medicine then these are the topics that one should be uh, uh, solving. Uh, Subhash, uh, hypodensity is ischemic stroke, right? The, our case had a hyperdensity. Uh, doctor, a few minutes more so you can maybe, you know, just put on your headphones and keep on listening. A 35-year-old man is having ascending symmetrical flaccid paralysis. So that's a standard opening line for gullian barre syndrome with facial diplegia. So that is, he's describing that seventh nerve palsy in the chap also. And then there is wide fluctuations in the BP because uh, neurogenic shock as manifestations can occur. Labile hypertension is a manifestation of gullian barre syndrome where there's going to be demyelination in the thoracic spine and uh, that can cause wide fluctuations in the blood pressure. The antibody which is present in this case is IgG class of antibody. The name of the antibody is IgG uh, and the name of the antibody is IgG anti-GM1 antibody. 
uh, why it is IgG antibodies because the course of this disease can be spreading over 28 days. I mean in Guillain-Barre syndrome the weakness may be developing as fast as over 12 hours but in some cases the weakness might be spread over weeks altogether. So because the illness is spread over almost 4 weeks that is why the class of antibody here is IgG. It, it is IgG anti GM1 antibody. So, I think it will IgM. Hoga. No, it is not IgM. It is IgG anti GM1 antibody. That M alphabet in our mind, no. We can think it as an IgM antibody. No, guys. Because here, four weeks, the progression of the disease can be there. No. I mean, like week one, he'll have leg paralysis. Week two, there will be truncal paralysis. Week three, arm paralysis. So, because the weakness spreads over weeks altogether, that is why IgG class of antibody would be present. And uh, then bladder and bubble involvement is not seen in Guillain-Barre syndrome. Electron diagnostic studies in the common variety shows demyelination only and not axonal damage. So I'm just putting plus minus to say that, you know, I still have one option to go and this may not be a right option to select. 85% cases show full functional recovery. Yes, guys, in Guillain-Barre syndrome, we will have a recovery. You obviously require a lot of willpower, a good physiotherapist. Uh, strong motivation from your side that the patient is able to get up on his feet and move around so he will be able to you know go to the bathroom by himself or uh, you know do his routine daily chores he, i'm not saying that he'll start doing running and weightlifting and stuff like that that might take a little longer and some people may not be able to do and resume gym activity but yes at least functionally speaking taking care of personal hygiene taking care of like you know making uh let me say a cup of tea for yourself or any routine small small things that this guy can be doing uh, the correct answer for this one is option number C. Uh, doctor, uh, diaphragmatic paralysis can be managed by putting the patient on a ventilator. And in ideal settings, we can avoid having uh, barotrauma, we can avoid having ventilator associated pneumonia. So, I agree to the fact that diaphragmatic uh, involvement is a very bad prognosis uh, in Indian setup in a government hospital. But uh, if we are working in uh, settings where we do not have these complications like ventilator associated pneumonia due to good infection control policy of the hospital, uh, we are not having a pneumothorax, then uh, we will be able to get this guy off the ventilator because we have given immunoglobulins. So, uh, okay, axonal and demyelination. Okay, doctor. Uh, at the moment, what I can say is uh, we have to just focus on the core aspects of uh, majority of these uh, defects being having a demyelination pattern. But yes, those F reflexes and H reflexes, they are are what are they they are worth their weight in the exam. So uh, uh, yes, Dr. Uh, somebody mentioned Dr. Ravi Shankar. What I'll try to do is in my subsequent uh, session, I'll I'll try to make up a table and explain those uh, uh, nerve conduction velocity and uh, specific findings related to each one of them, especially the H reflex and the F reflexes. If facial palsy, it means he, no, no, there's not a not a guarantee, doctor. It's not a guarantee that because it's a patchy demyelination, no, this demyelination is not like that always all the parts of the spinal cord could be involved. It could be like maybe the cervical spine may not be involved and uh, it might be only, I mean, uh, uh, there's a possibility that C3, C4, C5 might escape also. So we cannot predict on the basis of facial palsy in this particular case. Uh, AVG part doctor I had taken care in the morning session we had done four AVGs in a single question and I described partially compensated uncompensated and fully compensated three scenarios I had discussed in a single question so I would request you to look at uh, that uh, AVG questions in session one in the morning okay uh, Jaya uh, can you just rephrase how to differentiate I could not pick that up and uh, let's move on to the next one meanwhile he says which of the following will not be useful for management of acute ischemic stroke. Uh, dual antibiotic therapy is used anyway. We use thrombolysis in the patient as well. And uh, okay, I am getting a C. C to karte in a thrombolysis. He's saying which is not useful in the management of this patient. And then we go in for endovascular revascularization. That endovascular revascularization is thrombectomy. So uh, this thrombectomy will be done if a stroke patient is presenting between 6 to 24 hours of consultation. If he presents in the first 6 hours, we will be going ahead with thrombolysis, though the window period is obviously 4.5 hours ideally, but up to 6 hours we can be doing thrombolysis. But anticoagulation is not useful in management of acute ischemic stroke. It plays a role with respect to prevention. I mean, oral anticoagulation will be useful, for example, if a person is having valvular atrial fibrillation. Like is a known case of rheumatic heart disease, is having mitral stenosis. So in these patients, a valvular atrial fibrillation to prevent the chances of PAA. 
to prevent the chances of development of stroke any patient of valvular atrial fibrillation will be put on warfarin if a patient is having non valvular atrial fibrillation then in those circumstances to prevent the chances of development of a tia slash stroke the drug that will be starting the patient on would be like apixaban or rivaroxaban that is novel oral anticoagulant agents so uh, these drugs are mainly used for preventive purposes and they would not be useful to uh, manage an acute case of ischemic stroke where like you know the oral anticoagulation anyway the patient is going to be sick so uh, oral anticoagulation is something that we always use post discharge in our patients it's more of a preventive strategy preventive strategy as compared to a acute intervention per se the answer to this one is option number a and uh, let's focus on the next one at our disposal uh, again a repeat from the exam in which uh, if i say anything more the things will become very obvious there were only four complexes given and the fourth complex was not even visible fully it was only partial complex that was visible uh, you had to pick up this uh, pr interval in this particular case where it's a normal sinus rhythm as of now but then you can notice a T followed by a P and then there's a drop. So this is where it's the heart block which has to be picked up. And uh, what you need to check out in this question is that if you evaluate the PR interval after the drop beat and you check out the PR interval before the drop beat because they're equal equal. So considering that they mathematically look almost of the same size or equal, uh, this would be answered by you as morbid to heart block. There was no movements to heart block in the option, so the correct answer for this one would be option number C. That would be uh, that would be uh, a second degree heart block. Uh, no, 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 not a sort of appearance. Uh, it would be a second degree heart block, and this would be called as a infranodal heart block. In fact, the description that I've given you, the defect would be at uh, the bundle of fist. So we call it M2. We call it movements to heart block. The correct answer for this one is option number C. Uh, how does third degree heart block present? The number of P's will not match with the number of R's and the PP interval and RR interval will not match. So I'm just going to do a quick sketch on uh, the third degree heart block. It's a P followed by a P. Normally that doesn't happen. Then you might be getting a QRS complex at T again followed by a P. If you scan through this ECG, you'll notice that the number of P's are much much more as compared to the number of the r waves like there are almost six p's present and there are only two r waves present normally the number of p's and number of r will always match and even the pp interval in the rr interval is having a huge huge disparity so you can see the gross difference which is present for the current one which is also called as stokes adam syndrome Yes, third degree heart block will be having giant A waves that is canon A waves because of the AV dissociation that is present. That would be canon A waves. Uh, two is to one, doctor, will be based on the fact. Uh, interesting one, moon child, you put it up because Mobitz 2 can easily be confused as a two is to one block, but the difference will be in Mobitz 2 heart block, there would be normal sinus rhythm, non conducted wave. No, mo, uh, uh, I mean, when you scan through it, no, in a Mobitz 2 heart block, it would be like this is normal. And then there's a T followed by a drop. And then the rhythm resumes once again. So what you're noticing here is that this will occur alternatively. Like in Mobitz 2, you know, what is happening is like there would be three complexes, then a drop, then maybe four complexes, then a drop. Here it would be like conduction, drop, conduction, drop like that. So because it's like one is conducted, one is not conducted, we call it a two is to one block. So two is to one block is a differential diagnosis of Mobitz 2. The main concept is conduction non-conduction conduction non-conduction non whereas in uh, in mobits to it's like conduction 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 and then there's a drop occurring so uh, if you find multiple pqrs pqrs with equal pr 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 and then drops present answer it as mobits to if it's alternatively occurring you'll call it a two is to one uh, no not stroke adam i think that's a typing mistake stokes s-t-o-a-k-e-s that is stokes adam syndrome a stroke Adam is a technical word for third degree doctor. Okay, so I think we are sorted for 16th. Let's move on to the 17th one. Uh, this is a 25 year old male. He's coming to me with morning stiffness and pain in the back. There's bilateral sacroiliitis present. So I'm thinking in terms of ankylosing spondylitis. And uh, there is a very clear cut sacroiliitis also described. 
uh, we can call dissociation and third degree heart block same uh, doctor we'll use the word third degree heart block now that's a more appropriate term because dissociation is present even in ventricular tachycardia na? So AV dissociation hota hai, wo ventricular tachycardia mein bhi hota hai. AV dissociation is not a specific feature, it's bradyarrhythmia. So you'll say heart block present. Yes, it is ankylosing spondylitis. He's asking what is the initial treatment for this case. So option A and option B, they are useful for management of rheumatoid arthritis. So for this particular case, it would mainly be NSAIDs. And you can quickly comment in the chat box with respect to uh, what is the drug of choice for management of this condition. For management of ankylosing spondylitis, again this condition is extra parenchymal restrictive lung disease. So even this will be having an increased residual volume. Normally residual volume is increased in asthma, but increased residual volume we discussed today can be seen in myasthenia gravis and can be seen in ankylosing spondylitis also. Increase RV was discussed for asthma COPD, air trapping, myasthenia gravis because they cannot push proper air out of their lungs. And even ankylosing spondylitis because of the costochondritis component and the stiffness of the chest wall, they will not be able to push air out of their lungs. Yes, we'll be using infliximab for management of these patients for ankylosing spondylitis. Right. So we are sorted for 17. Uh, the answer for this one is C. Let's look at the next one. We are having this 70 year old man. He's presented with early satiety, weight loss, progressive pallor and petechia. Standard feature for any hemat malignancy because both bleeding and anemia is given simultaneously in a patient. Yes, there is no understanding subash between the atria and the ventricles. That is why it's called as AV dissociation. But as I explained, now, AV dissociation can be present even in ventricular tachycardia where there is no understanding between the upper and the lower chambers. So the more specific term for, uh, I mean, if I have to describe a third degree heart block, I'll say it's Stokes Adam, I'll say third degree heart block rather than saying AV dissociation. Okay, so for this one, guys, uh, there's an old man, there's features of hemat malignancy, there's a splenomegaly with cervical lymphadenopathy. Uh, the main features in this chap is one is anemia. Uh, then there's a thrombocytopenia also present. Platelet count of this chap is relatively in the lower side. TLC is elevated because there's a possible blood cancer. And uh, what you have to pick up is in the peripheral smear, the presence of these nasty looking cells, which are fragile, uh, immature B cells in the circulation, which are called as smudge cells. What you can also pick up in the circulation is these RBCs which lack central pallor. Considering that the RBCs are lacking that uh, central pallor, we are going to call them spherocytes. And therefore, the diagnosis of this patient based on smart cells, RBCs lack central pallor, that is spherocytes would be uh, chronic lymphocytic leukemia. Chronic lymphocytic leukemia has autoimmune hemolytic anemia, AIHA. And there are smart cells present. These smart cells are basically fragile immuno incompetent or fragile uh, B cells basically I'm gonna call them immuno incompetent because they do not know how to differentiate between self and non-self you know normally the the security system can differentiate between the self and the non-self component component but in this condition like they are not able to differentiate self versus non-self so they're attacking self RBCs only the clinical diagnosis of this patient is chronic lymphocytic leukemia and the best way for diagnosis of this patient would be uh, peripheral blood flow cytometry. The answer for this one is option number B. Option number C and D will be suited for chronic myeloid leukemia. If it was chronic myeloid leukemia, then the findings would have been one presence of basophils. Basophil count should have been elevated. And then is shift to the left. Shift to the left means that all the immature cells, that is myelocytes, metamyelocytes, promyelocytes, all those cells would be uh, present in the circulation so in this slide only one type of cells are present and that are B, B cells only now you can see one neutrophil all other are B lymphocytes that are present so considering the presentation of basophilia uh, absence of basophilia shift to left not being present in this case this is not chronic myeloid leukemia okay pseudo gotcher <laughs> okay but then at the same time you also have to take into consideration the simultaneous uh, uh, picture in the patient from the blood work perspective also know that there is a anemia there is a thrombocytopenia there is an elevated TLC in the guy 70 year old man cervical lymphadenopathy organomegaly all these when we add together is chronic lymphocytic leukemia 
so to confirm no no for chronic lymphocytic leukemia we don't need to go for fish uh, which would be more for chronic myeloid leukemia as a diagnosis uh, here flow cytometry will be sufficient no because here you will not only be seeing like uh, cd19 cd20 but apart from like uh, the special feature would be presence of cd5 i mean this is a b cell with cd5 positivity which is the peculiarity of chronic lymphocytic leukemia ha ha wo garden party or garden school girl appearance you know that fancy terms in pathology you can remember but here you will have to pick up the data uh, cml uh, one the cml presentation in this particular case if i look it up you know it should always say masses phenomegaly in this particular question there is no mention of masses phenomegaly that is one and then uh, another feature that is very characteristic for chronic myeloid leukemia would be presence of pruritus uh, especially on taking a hot shower lot of itching would be present a lot of patients of cml will come to you with uh, uh, wrong diagnosis of atopic dermatitis because every time take a take a shower with hot water it starts itching all over even you and me know in this hot summer if you take a shower with hot water it will cause a bit of itching the basophils locally will release histamine but in this chap i mean it's going to be exceptionally high uh pruritus present on taking a bath early satiety would come in massive spinomegaly would come in and then the blood picture will do the remaining part uh, thrombotic events are very late in uh, chronic myeloid leukemia so in the early part if we want to differentiate those are the features which are present uh, uh for all blood cancers guys you need to know the main investigation of choice uh it can always be answered as uh i mean fish is mainly for chromosomal translocation so that would be a specific answer for chronic myeloid leukemia we can use it even in uh, other leukemias as well but for chronic lymphocytic leukemia it's always a peripheral blood examination which is to be used yeah yeah i think this question tells you that there is no point of going into garden party or garden school or whatever the technical terms they they are very nice to listen to but then you have to correlate them with with the remaining remaining aspects that i have discussed before you the answer to this one is option number b okay guys let's do this one a uh, quick answers here patient is having features of fever uh, why not a bone marrow biopsy doctor we do bone marrow biopsy in myelofibrosis i mean conditions where we do a biopsy for diagnosis or multiple myeloma then we do bone marrow biopsy in diagnosis for myelofibrosis uh, we might be doing bone marrow biopsy in some cases of acute myeloid leukemia as well because they tend to differentiate into myelodysplastic syndrome or mds so i mean those are situations where you might be doing a bone marrow biopsy for aml i've written like you know late some stages only or some forms only but uh, let's have the answers for this one patient is having features of fever with nuchal rigidity csf preparation was done for india ink and there is presence of neutrophils present uh, there is presence of low sugar with elevated protein and gram positive organisms are seen uh, i think considering that uh, there is gram positive organisms you would not answer this as cryptococcal meningitis because india ink is not only going to help in diagnosis of cryptococcus but india ink will also demonstrate the capsule of pneumococcus you see in this particular case uh, there is a distraction present in the question by writing india ink and by reading india ink you don't have to straight away think in terms of cryptococcus because pneumococcus will also have a capsule india ink guys is a negative strain india ink is a negative strain uh, it does not stain the organism it stains the background the capsule is the one that will basically be stained and the main highlight for this question is presence of neutrophils the neutrophils are not seen in cryptococcal meningitis neutrophils are seen in bacterial meningitis and along with that obviously there's a low sugar there is elevated proteins gram positive organisms so yeah yeah the quelling reaction but not exactly a quelling reaction in a sense that uh, india ink is only a distraction in this question the main pointer is neutrophils being increased which makes the diagnosis of this case as pneumococcal meningitis uh, the remaining two options will be having lymphocytes the remaining two options will be having lymphocytes in the csf so we are sorted with uh, this question okay not exactly a moe moe you just have to be uh, you know picking up the key words in the questions and the diagnosis is not based on the basis of the stain but the diagnosis is made on the basis of uh, the the csf presentation yeah doctor it's uh, <laughs> today is uh, bisakhi so people are celebrating so let people celebrate the doctors are studying right so, dance kar rahe. so let them enjoy right absolutely absolutely 
ऑप्शन नंबर सी एंड डी आर द वंस व्हिच आर गोना बी इन इंडिया सर पीपल सेलिब्रेट एट द स्मॉलेस्ट ऑप्शन अवेलेबल बिकॉज़ देयर लिमिटेड ऑप्शंस अवेलेबल इन इंडिया राइट टू सेलिब्रेट ओके जी सो आंसर टू दिस वन इज ऑप्शन नंबर बी लेट्स मूव ऑन टू द नेक्स्ट वन uh let's have your input fair and uh, this would be uh, one of the last questions for today uh, that is noguchi classification is done for yes guys <laughs> okay guys uh dogs of cardiovascular neuro uh, endocrine ye to basically dekho karna hi karna hai then abg analysis karna hai karna hai and uh, last mein vasculitis thoda sa pad lena but then you know the questions on vasculitis are i think easy to pick up so i don't find any errors in them unless and until they want to get very nasty and want to give you some stains also from which you'll have to pick up okay guys uh, noguchi classification is used for evaluation of uh, this would be for uh, adenocarcinoma the lung and neuroblastoma the classification that we use is shimeda so there are two japanese classifications that we read and i just thought that i'll just quickly mention that that was just to take off the pressure like we use uh, dukes for carcinoma colon we use uh, noguchi for adenocarcinoma we use chang classification for medulloblastoma good i mentioned that and then for neuroblastoma is shimeda so yep i mean uh, these are couple of other classifications which uh, one should be aware of so uh, res- uh, respiratory doctor uh, staff for years uh, it is abg analysis and uh, spirometric analysis that you must be doing so uh, we are done for today guys uh, thank you so much for your patience and hearing me out and uh, in case you have any queries i'll just drop in my email id you can just uh, send me across your queries as well in case you want to ask any last minute doubts uh, i wish you the very best we have a mock test coming up on 17th onwards so try to give it and try to do as many questions every day and uh, you guys are going to do great in your future future careers Uh, I'm very very sure of the for it. I'm very optimistic about it because if you are having that uh, resilience to sit and listen to me for this long, I honestly, I mean, you know, uh, I thought it's a it's a Bissaki day, it's a holiday, so people would really not come and listen to a discussion. But uh, hats off to your dedication that you did that, and uh, you are on the right way to achieving uh, a success in your journey and success in your career. And that's just a small part of. Uh, whatever you gonna achieve i know there much more bigger things in life but then this exam is also that small small obstacle that you'll be able to surmount so thank you so much guys uh, take care god bless you uh, doc uh, if you have any doubts uh, you can send me meet i think you put up some doubt it went up so you can send me across at email i'll be glad to assist you uh, thank you guys uh, no no doc we'll be having more sessions planned and lined up uh, just give some time and uh, if i if we do it regularly it will obviously uh yeah i i would love to do that and uh, that would uh, help you as well so bye bye take care